Amen. So let's read together John 13. Well, I'll read it and you can read it with me. Um, John 13, verse 34. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Fantastic. So we are in the third of our series on um, on love, all you need is love, and we're following this um, uh, this booklet as well. This is um, a booklet that was written by Rod as a as a help to us as a church to um, to encourage and grow in our discipling of one another. It's called making disciple makers. And just on the inside, if you haven't got one of these, please do grab one from the back and take one home with you. And they're fantastic for using for one-to-one conversations or in groups and so on. And um, the first question, uh, it's just a number of questions in here, but the first one is, what is God saying to you? And we're looking at how God loves us, how we can love our neighbors, um, loving as we love ourselves. And this little symbol here of the hand shaking is what we're looking at today, loving one another. And um, the question that follows that is, what are you going to do about it? So it doesn't kind of just leave us with um, just saying, you know, well, okay, what does it mean? It's actually, what am I going to do about it? Which actually changes everything. And so um, as we look at uh, this um, encouragement today, love one another, love one another. I wonder if you can just, um, I just want to encourage you to think of occasions where you've experienced someone loving you beyond what you were expecting. Particularly in the church, has someone done something for you or you've encountered someone um, going above and beyond what is normal? And why don't you just uh, turn to a neighbor and just tell them how you might have experienced that yourself. Okay, go for it. Have you experienced Someone loving you, perhaps inside the church, someone loving you beyond what you were expecting. So, that Alistair came in the journey into life, and that was his way of showing that he cared and loved for him. That's amazing. Okay. Now, I'm very aware that um, some people um, are very good verbal processors and other people just prefer to think a little bit more time. And so apologies for the people in the latter category who just think, okay, I need a bit more time to think about that. Um, And usually, in my experience, um, those people come up with much more profound things to say. So if you've got something profound to kind of bring to mind later on, (laughs) please do. I'm not one of those people. I'm definitely um, the former category. So... um, This command, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. First thing I want to, I want to just really unpack this verse in detail and allow it to speak to us. And um, the first thing we see Jesus encouraging is obeying, obeying. I'm going to just, um, uh, I like drawing. I'm not very good at drawing, but um, I can draw so simply that anyone can, can, get, um, can do this. So this is um, King Jesus, and here is you and me. Actually, there we go. That's the a hand um, uh, saluting. Okay, so there we go. So it's not a very good salute. It needs to work on that a bit more. Um, and this is about obeying, obeying God's commands. There's some, you know, this verse in its context is Jesus speaking to the disciples at the Last Supper. 
And um, when Jesus says, a new command I give you, okay, Jesus is God. And if there's one person worth following and worth obeying, it's God. So, um, you know, we've looked at the last couple of weeks and at the commands of God. Jesus summarized the whole of the law by saying, actually, you need to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, all of the law hangs on these two commandments. Everything about uh, what it means to, um, to obey God is summarized in those two commandments. And Jesus here says, a new command I give you. And it's not as if this command hasn't been in the, New Testament, in the Old Testament already. It's all over the Old Testament. But Jesus is, if you like, giving something fresh. He's giving a new um, depth, a new look at this um, need to love one another. And it's not just about loving your neighbor. It is about loving one another. He's speaking to Christians. He's speaking to disciples. Um, Tom Wright, who um, is an author and theologian, he's a bishop in the Church of England as well. He's um, written the series of Bible for Today commentaries, which I really commend to you, just a little passage and then a little explanation afterwards. Fantastic ways of getting deeper into the scriptures on a daily basis. But he um, said this about this uh, verse. He said, these words of Jesus are the simplest, clearest, hardest command of all. Simplest, clearest, hardest commandment of all. There's this um, uh, Arabian horses. Okay, so Arabian horses are amazing horses. They are, um, they're the ones that, that, you know, when you see them uh, doing these um, amazing tricks and, and um, racing and just a whole variety of things, but they're, they're known for their obedience. And the way they train horses in the Middle East, these Arabian horses, is that, you know, they have a long period of training. And then one of the last and final most difficult tests is that they will... Um, uh, work the horses without water for many days. And then um, they'll bring them um, within a few uh, meters of water. And then they'll, um, they'll unsaddle them and, or kind of get off the horses and, and just let them go to the water. And at the last moment, just, just they're get, going to get to the water to quench their thirst, they blow a whistle, which is their, um, how to, uh, to respond to a command. And the horses that have been trained most and who are most obedient stop just when they need the water most and they return to their, um, to their master. And it's those ones that have passed the test. And then when they come back, when they've waited a while, they um, uh, say, go and get a, a drink, you know, in horse language, whatever it is, you know, go. <laughs> and so, <laughs> now... Um, you know, the point is this. You, know, you might think, gosh, that's cruel. That is really harsh to treat a horse like that. But the reason they do that is because when they're in the desert, the riders will come to depend for their lives often on a horse that needs to obey. And if that horse is not completely obedient, it will not look after its, um, its rider's life. And that must be, um, that is absolutely essential to the training of these horses. And in a similar way, we need to allow God to train us. And sometimes that means um, tantalizing um, situations where we're just longing to break through to something. But God says, no, wait, hold back, obey him. And why, why is this a command? Why is there a command to love one another? Well, this is about God's nature. It is about his, who he is. God is completely generous. He is full of generosity. And the outworking of that generosity is love. He loves us so much. And he wants his children, you and me, to be like him. He wants us to have that heart of generosity, to love as he loves. He wants that love to flow. And, and so it is essential. It's an essential thing for you and me to be loving. It is a command to uh, to love. That's the first thing Jesus says, a new command I give you. Second thing is, uh, just unpack this the next stage, is to love one another. I want to pick out here um, belonging. 
here is a group of you and me. You look amazing. And we're together. Let's just put some little, because you're really okay about all this. Belonging. Love one another. Um, the command is to love one another. It's not like an abstract thing of just let love be in the air. Um, you know, let's just um, make sure that, you know, it just feels great. Actually, this is a command to love one another. The word love there is, is agape. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, a, a sacrificial love. It's, a, it's an otherly love. It's not love that I'm going to benefit from. It's love that you are going to benefit from. And it's love for a specific group of people. It's loving one another. In the scriptures and in our Christian lives, we're encouraged to love our neighbors outside the church. But this is a specific command to love one another. Sometimes people, particularly more missionally minded people, think, actually, I haven't got time for people in the church. I've got to be out there. This is a command to every Christian to love um, those people within the church, to love one another. And the special characteristic that Jesus wants to find in his church is love, is loving relationships, is people loving each other in an extraordinary way. We had a leaders meeting here in the church on Monday night. And um, one of the things we did was we had some feedback about what we thought God was saying to us. And there was one moment that really stood out for me, which is when Josh Harris um, just said, he just asked the question, are we um, consuming or belonging in the church? Is that the, the characteristic of what's going on? Are we consumers or belongers? And I think what he was saying was, um, you know, do we come to St. Paul Shadwell as people who consume, people who come because, um, uh, well, the, the teaching might all, not always be good, but you know, you're coming to receive from in the teaching, the worship's fantastic, oh, it's great worship. You know, um, we come to be served, we come to bring our children to children's church because you know, they're looked after. There are so many ways that we can receive. And so if we don't come one week, well, it doesn't really matter because you know, I'm not getting what I might normally get, but that's okay. So that, that approach, consumerist, which is so much our society, we, we want people to do things for us. So we might leave church today thinking, well, you know, the teaching wasn't very good. You know, maybe next time it'll be okay. <laughs> and um, because it's about what I am going to get from this experience. Or are we people, consumers, or are we belongers? Do we belong? Is that the nature of what um, our church experience is about? To belong is to think about actually how much you mean to me and I mean to you. How can I serve you? How can I encourage you? How can I support you? How can I love you? How can I um, watch out for you? What's going on in your life? How can I um, surround you with um, all that you need? And when everyone is doing that, actually those people feel they belong and actually they feel you belong to them. That makes a huge difference, that, that difference, consuming or belonging. What are we? What do we want to make happen in this church? How can we encourage that in this community? I think the thing is, Jesus does not want us to be isolated from each other, almost like someone standing here, being in the same room, but not belonging to that group of people. I think that's why we keep on banging on about connect groups, you know, joining a connect group or joining a group of some kind where we can belong, where we feel actually we can begin to be known and where we can know actively other people. That makes such a difference. I think that's why I want to encourage people to make a priority, I'm speaking to the converted here, but making a priority of coming to church because, you know, it's so easy in our busy, busy lives that church can sometimes come um, second after a whole list of other things. It becomes almost like a leisure activity rather than actually a people who love one another, who are, who are there for one another, who belong to each other. So, belonging. Obeying, belonging. A third thing here that we see is following. And I'm going to draw this. Here's... Um, this is, this is Jesus. Let's 
great likeness. And uh, here is... You and me. So, following, let me just write that down so you can remember what I'm saying. Following. This is an encouragement, by the way, not to sit in the back row so you can actually see what's going on. So, um, following. What, what does this love actually look like? Jesus says this. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. So this love is to look like the way Jesus loved. So we follow him. We follow him in, in every way. It looks like Jesus. It, it's, you know, the invitation really is to follow him. Um, I heard about this woman who was um, doing this application to go to university. And one of the questions um, in the, uh, the application form was this, are you a leader? And um, she wants to be honest and um, real about herself, so she said no. And, um, she, but she thought, the way the question was phrased, that actually she should have really been saying yes, but she just thought, yeah, I'm not. And, and so she slightly waited with bated breath for the answer to come back, and she was expecting basically a rejection. You know, uh, you, you, know you, you need to be a leader to get on and you know, to learn. And, and um, to her surprise, she received this letter back uh, from the university. It said this, Dear applicant, a study of the application forms reveals that this year our college will have 1,452 new leaders. We are accepting you because we feel it's imperative that they have at least one follower. <laughs> so, you know, if you're, if you're learning about leadership, one of the first things you learn is that in order to lead well, you need to learn to be led well. And if I'm looking out for leaders, I'm looking for people who know how to follow. And actually, that they have learnt um, what it means to follow so that they can encourage others to follow them. So when we widen our, our, our study just to, um, outside these two verses, we begin to see what kind of way Jesus loved. And the first way, I think, is that he welcomes. He welcomes people with open arms. When you think about um, the story Jesus told of the, of the father and the prodigal son, the, the prodigal son who um, has run away from, uh, from the fa his father and who comes to his senses when he's kind of just spent everything and he comes back to the father who represents God and, and the father's waiting and he runs towards him with open arms. This is the welcome that God the father and Jesus gives to us with open arms, that generous heart saying, welcome in. Welcoming is so important. The reason we find it so hard, I think, to welcome or to experience this is because we are suspicious that God would really love us completely like this. And when we, um, when we try to welcome others with open arms, I think one of the reasons we struggle with that is because we sometimes think, actually, will people love me? Will they reject my love if I love like that? But you know, it doesn't matter. Jesus shows the way and says, I'm going to love you, whatever. I'm going to welcome you with open arms. And we want to encourage everyone here to be a welcomer. So every new person who comes through these doors is welcomed, not by the welcome team. They, that's their sp special role. And um, we want to encourage, if you're not on the welcome team or a welcome team, come and join them. That's fantastic. But we want everyone to be a welcomer, to spot those people who are new, to say, actually, you know, is this your first time? It doesn't matter if it isn't. Um, you know, how long have you been coming? Um, we'd love to encourage you to get your details on a connect card and drop it in the back of the, uh, back of the church. Don't let the leaders do all that. Let, you know, that's every one of us needs to be welcoming. Are you in a connect group? Come and join mine. Come and see what it's like. Welcoming. Um, another way we see Jesus um, loving is selflessly, selflessly. Jesus' desire is to give himself to us. Look at just this um, passage just before, at the beginning of chapter 13, where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. It's something very difficult for Peter, one of the, the, one of the leaders amongst the disciples, to receive to receive this selfless, unconditional love. What was Jesus doing? He was demonstrating 
um, that it was about um, being selfless to serve others without um, you know, getting anything for himself. To serve. I think for us, the reality, the reality for me is actually what's uppermost in my own mind is, is my own needs. You know, I'm really hungry, or you know, I, I really need a coffee badly um, when I come in. <laughs> That's, you know, I do often. <laughs> um, I, I think you know, my own needs are uppermost in my own heart and mind. But Jesus, what he's saying is, we need to put those needs second and come to Jesus and to one another first, to be selfless. And we learn to do that by serving one another. The serving teams in church, I think, have two main functions. First one is an obvious one, which is it's great to actually provide something for people to be welcoming. But the second thing is actually because it's for you. Because it, when you serve, it changes your heart. It actually helps, it helps me to learn to, you know, when I serve others, to learn that actually the, when I put myself first, actually that's not the right priority. It needs to be the other way around. I need to put you first. When I do that, I've, and when I'm, lots of people are doing that, actually my needs get looked after as well. Selfless. A third thing within this is sacrificial. Jesus gave up everything for you and for me. We see it supremely on the cross. God so loved the world that he gave his son, one and only son, to come and rescue us and save us. He came and lived a life for us. He gave up all the comfort of heaven to come and love us and to come and um, give everything for us, particularly wanting to help us to, um, to deal with all the stuff that stops us, that inhibits us from being close to God. He took those things on his own shoulders when he died on the cross. He said, you know, if you trust me with these things, I'll take them away so that you can be blameless before God. You can have an open relationship with God, free. That's what God has done for you. That's the way he loves, sacrificially. And so he says, be like me, follow me. Be sacrificial in the way that you um, relate to others. A fourth area is being real. I think it's so hard, says he kind of taking a posture of defensiveness, um, it's so hard to be real sometimes with one another. The reason for that, I think, is that we feel, if I told you what I'm really like, I think you'll reject me. I think you won't like me anymore. You won't, or you'll judge me, you'll think bad thoughts about me. And I can't handle that, so I'm going to actually pretend to be something slightly different. I'm going to pretend, not massively, but I'm just going to hide away the difficult bits of my life so you can't see those. And I'll just show you the really good bits. And, you know, I'm really nice and that I'm kind and I'm always happy. And, you know. But actually, there, there are bits of all of our lives which are not like that. And part of being real is bringing those things to the front and saying, do you know something? I am not a perfect human being. It's so hard for us to admit this. It's so hard to say, you know, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm, um, I'm broken, I'm, um, I'm living this pattern of life that is not what I'd like to be living, whatever it is. We see this in the way Peter, I think, the, the lead disciple, is treated here. So when, um, when Jesus says, you know, after Peter's had his feet washed, and he says, no, I want everything washed. And um, Jesus says, you know, you're, um, you're clean enough. And he says, you know, I'll follow you wherever. And Jesus says, actually, do you know something? There's going to be a time quite soon, it's going to be the next day, possibly even that night, when you're going to betray me. You're going to really let me down. And Peter says, no, I'll, I'll go to the death for you. Jesus is actually, you know, you're going to betray me and you'll know when the cock crows three times. And that happened later on. He suddenly realized that his words, his um, attempt to this bravado to say, I'm really amazing, I'll follow you through anything. And Jesus calls it and says, the reality of you, Peter, is that you can't do that and you won't do that. Admit it. That's really what he's saying. And for us, I think the amazing thing is Jesus is so gracious and gentle with Peter. 
And he's so gracious and gentle with us. He treats us and he, know, you know, he knows what you're like and he still loves you. He knows everything about you. He knows what's hidden. He knows what you close the door to so that no one else can see. He knows what's going on. He knows the thoughts, the words, the actions. And he still loves you. It's that amazing verse in Romans. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He knows what we're like. And he still loves us and died for us. So this is the way Jesus says, I want you to be like this with yourself. I want you to be real with each other. I want you to have the courage to say, all is not well. And do you know something? I have to say, as we just, this is a church community where I've seen that. And I just want to encourage that more, to encourage that um, honesty and integrity. It particularly, it's easier with smaller groups of people, or one-to-one, because you grow to trust people enough to be real with them. But we want to encourage that in small groups, one-to-one prayer, whatever it is, to be real with one another. It's when we're real with one another that this love begins, we begin to be like Jesus in, in that way. We become a community that can handle real issues and real challenges, real people. That is a very attractive thing in itself. Final thing in this, we've talked about um, uh, being welcoming, selfless, sacrificial, real. The final thing Jesus expresses love is forgiveness, forgiving. The disciples were constantly and consistently blind to his teaching. Um, they uh, They were completely insensitive often. They were slow to learn. They were cowardly. Um, But there is no failure that Jesus can't forgive. He forgives us. And so if there's something that um, you find either difficult to forgive in someone else or to be forgiven for, you need to know that Jesus loves you so much that he uh, gives you the power to forgive and the power to receive forgiveness. That is the kind of love we're talking about. And that's the kind of love that Jesus wants us to love like. Now, we won't become experts overnight, but we start by starting. We start by just taking Uh, a gamble with one of these areas and you're saying, Jesus, I'm going to be real. Jesus, I'm going to forgive. Jesus, I'm going to welcome. Jesus, I'm going to be selfless in this situation. I'm going to serve. Jesus, help me to follow you with the love that you show. Final way I think we get from this passage is if you look at the next verse. By this, verse 35, this kind of loving, by this, Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So this is about showing. And I just can't remember what's the picture I was going to do. Oh, yeah. Okay. So bear with me. seen coats of arms? This is supposed to be a coat of arms. Okay. Coats of arms need to be spelt right. So, (laughs) love one another. So here is a badge. Here's a shield. This is the coat of arms that you say, this is what I'm about. This is the description of my family. This is the back of church over there. Just turn around. There's a coat of arms on on the wall. That is a coat of arms of Charles II. That um, shows the time that when this church was first started. And coats of arms in churches are a symbol. The head of the church in the Church of England is the king or the queen. That badge there is the badge of the king saying, this, I, I want to be known as someone who is part of a worshipping community. The badge we are to have as Christians that we show to the whole world is that we love one another. It's by your love for one another that people will know that you are my disciples. Loving one another. This is to be the badge of the Christian community of the church. It's about you loving me, us loving them, them loving um, you loving them, me loving you know, one another. We're all involved in this, every one of us. 
We've got to be quick to um, realize that actually we haven't been very good at this in the world. There is so much division and fighting between Christians through the centuries. We've got to say sorry all the time. To say, you know, we've, we've, we've made a mess. Catholics against Protestants. The Catholic Church against the Orthodox Church in the 10th century. Just the ways in which you know, denominations fight with each other and churches fight with each other, and even Christians inside churches. We need to be quick to say sorry to one another. But at the same time, we need to start behaving as Jesus wants us to behave, which is to love one another as a sign to the world. That's why we want to speak well of other church leaders. We've prayed for other churches and church leaders this morning. We want to speak well of them. Even if we disagree with them, we can still speak well of them and honor them. Um, Alpha is an amazing course, this course which is an introduction to the Christian faith, fantastic to invite other people to. We're just on the second week this week if you want to invite someone to that at Departure Cafe Tuesday night. Alpha is being used by every major Christian denomination and it's an extraordinary sign of unity where all these different denominations are choosing to use this course. Sign of loving one another. It's an outworking of that. Um, We... um, you know, I love the way that uh, that's happening in St. Paul's, where people are inviting friends to come to church, to come and experience a Christian community loving one another. That's the same with connect groups. Um, we want them to be outward-facing communities. They're a community of faith, but they're outward-facing. So um, just some examples of that. You know, the, the night shelter uh, is organized by Sarah Opie, who's in the Lang Connect Group, um, Charlie and Katie Lang's group. And one of the things they do is they've got their connect group to get... V- very involved in the night shelter, invited other people in the church to do that. But one of the things she says is, when you invite a friend to come with you, a friend from outside the church, to come and experience this serving together so they can experience this kind of love. The um, Lanaro um, Connect Group is, you know, every month they do a, a walk in, a, um, in the countryside and they invite other families to come and experience their Connect Group, um, just going for a walk together, experiencing Christian community. It's a fantastic way to express this. Um, And there are so many different ways here in the church. I love the story, and I tell this often at weddings that I lead, which is um, of Leonard Bernstein. He is a famous conductor, composer, American man. And he was asked in an interview once, what's the hardest instrument to play in the orchestra? And he replied without hesitation, second violin. He said, I can get plenty of first violins, But to find someone who is prepared to play second violin or second horn or second flute, that's a problem. But if no one's prepared to play second, there can be no harmony. To love one another is about putting other people first. It's about preferring others over ourselves. It's, that's the, the nature of this community. That's what it needs to be in. And we need to be inviting others to experience this so that other people can see it. I think that's why Jesus says, by this people will know that you're my disciples. They need to see it, to experience it, to know that that's going on. So it needs to be some way invitational or open to the public. So, it's a command to obey. A new command I give you. To love one another, where we belong to each other, where we're beginning to express what that means to to come to one another and live our lives together, to demonstrate that love for each other. To love as Jesus loved us. Following Jesus in his, the way God welcomes us, the way we are to be selfless, to be sacrificial, to be real, Um, and to be forgiving. And by letting this um, love be seen by others, by this everyone will know that you're my disciples, showing that love as as, as almost a badge that we wear as a community. how How do we do this in practice? The only way, I think, is by receiving love that we can give this love away. We receive God's love And then we give that love to one another and to our neighbors and our friends. So let's stand.